Hi everyone, uh, my name is Amit Bhatt. I am the Executive Director for Transport at WRI India. Uh, I am based in Delhi and lead uh, all the transport work uh, in WRI India. Welcome to this session, uh, Delhi Street Lab Learn. And today what we'll be doing is that we'll be talking about this online capacity building session for engineers. Uh, engineers from Public Works Department, Municipal Corporation of Delhi and other departments who are involved in road transportation can benefit out of this session. Uh, people who are involved with street design, road design, planning, design, implementation, it's for everyone who is involved in this segment. So basically what we will do today is that we will kind of go over through best practices on how to improve safety as well as accessibility on the streets of Delhi. And Modules like this that will be coming on will be short about 15 20 minutes and it will help you go through some of the fundamentals of uh, why are we doing this, why safety and accessibility on daily roads is important, how does one go about doing it, and also uh, if these kind of experiments, uh, learnings have ever been tried in the other parts of the world, how have they gone ahead uh, and, uh, and done it. So. It's going to be very short and crisp. Uh, and in this session, we'll be talking more about the principles around safety and accessibility when it comes to road transportation in general, but more specifically when it comes to roads and streets in our cities. So let's start uh, moving ahead on, on this subject. Now, this is the first module. And this is specifically going to talk about how does Delhi move? And when I say how does Delhi move, I'm going to talk at two ends of this spectrum. One, what is our perception? And second, what is our data which talks about mobility in Delhi? So let's start. Now, when you talk about Delhi and, and whether you are a person living in Delhi or, or, or in some other parts of the city, typically Delhi means traffic and we typically get uh, to see an image like this, where everything is stuck, nothing is moving. And when you look at these slides, you often wonder, why are we not doing enough road designs? Why are we not creating enough road space so that uh, we can get rid of the traffic congestion? Now, this is perception, but the reality is something totally different. And we'll, 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 we'll come to some of these questions when we look at data, and when we look at perception, and then how do we go about marrying the two so that we can talk about sustainable mobility in Delhi. Now, this is an interesting slide because contrary to the belief, the census of 2011 came up with some very starking num stark numbers on mobility. So for the first time, uh, uh, we, as a country, asked uh, the citizens, how do you commute to work? And the answers, as I said, were pretty striking. Remember, these numbers do not include agricultural workforce. So it's predominantly urban numbers to look at. So 30% Indians live in so close proximity to where they work, or they work in so close, in such a close proximity where you live, that they actually don't travel at all. 23% travel by foot and 13% use cycles as a mode of transport. So walking and cycling contributes more than a third of how India commutes to work. Two-wheelers is again 13%. But what is interesting is people taking their cars to work. Now that's mere 3%. But if you look at the slide which I showed earlier, we think everyone in our cities takes the car when he or she goes to work. Now that's not the case, especially when you look at the India numbers. And the difference one might say that probably these numbers are skewed because there is a lot of rural population which is involved in, but that's not the case. And I'll come to the slide which talks about how do we commute to work, especially in big cities around the country. The second bar uh, that you see is 
the bar for Delhi National Capital Territory. Now look at the blue bar. That's 25% people actually walking to work. Look at the red bar above the blue bar. That's people, amount of people who are traveling by bicycle. So if you add walking and cycling, about a third of the Delhi's population actually uses uh, uh, walking or cycling to go to work. That's a very, very substantive number. Now, if you look at the top uh, three bars uh, at the top of the bar chart in the Delhi category, you will realize that buses, train, and other forms of public transport carry almost a third of Delhi's population. So more than third walking and cycling and about third using public transport. Personal transport in Delhi is less than a third. And within that, a large portion is through two wheelers. So the fact of the matter is, even in Delhi, people using cars to go to work, which is remember predominant purpose of transport in our cities is just around less than 15%. Therefore, the question then becomes, when we start looking at city planning, when we start looking at mobility planning, why do we only look at car as a mode of transport where the majority of the population in our cities don't use car as a predominant mode of transport? If you look at Delhi, and, and this is the map of Delhi, uh, the road network in Delhi has increased 18% from 2000 and to 2016. And currently anywhere around 34,000 kilometers lane kilometers of roads are in Delhi. That typically translates to about 18 to 19% or close 20% of Delhi's area is under roads. And that's a pretty large number uh, of area under roads. Now within that road, we have jurisdiction by MCD, NHAI, uh, PWDs, and, and so on and so forth, including Delhi Cantonment. But Delhi has a huge amount of area under roads. That's one, probably the highest in the country, if you look at cities of that magnitude. Now, this is also the reason uh, that we also seeing uh, a growth in vehicle. Now, one can argue that whether more roads are leading to more vehicles or more vehicle is leading to more road. And in economics, we have heard on one side that the, the demand creates supply. On the other side, supply also creates demand. So a very steep increase in number of motor vehicles in the last couple of decades in Delhi, which is also the fact that Delhi has also huge area under roads. But what does this mean? Actually, if you look at this in the context of how Delhi moves, you will be surprised to note, and this is data which has come from uh, the report on uh, by the High Powered Committee on Decongestion of Traffic in Delhi. And what it said was interesting that walking, is about 35% in Delhi. And this data may be slightly old, 2007, but it still has a quite relevance. Again, I said 35% of people actually walk in Delhi. Buses, about 27%. And yes, Metro has come in, the share has, will have probably gone up. But I estimate that if you add buses and Metro together, that's about a third of uh, people using uh, public modes of transport walking and cycling another 30%. And the rest, if you look at, would go down as private mode of transport. But if you look at cars in, in this slide, that's about 9%. So the question then becomes, if 91% of people are not using car uh, as, as a mode of transport, why are we designing infrastructure in that manner? And that's where the whole perception comes into picture. Uh, we see the roads, stuck with traffic, we see cars, and we think everyone moves by car. That's not, not the case. Uh, and even if you extrapolate this number to current year, I think the car uh, usage in Delhi would still be less than 15%. So does more road uh, mean more demand? What is the evidence that we are getting from across the world? Now, this is an interesting example, which is, from Los Angeles in, U and in US called I-405. And the city spent almost a mil billion dollar trying to solve congestion on this, this stretch of road. And because the number of road, uh, the, the traffic in this road has increased, 
the city decided, let's expand the road. After spending a billion dollars and five years later, they realized that traffic has in fact gone slower than what it was before. Why? Because when you expand road, there is also a lot of latent demand which is there, which comes on and starts using these, these uh, facilities. So expanding road to solve traffic congestion does not work because a lot of new users come on and take the new space which the road has created. And we don't have to realize this by only going to Los Angeles. In fact, this is our very own I-405, the Delhi uh, Gurgaon Expressway or NH8 as we call. And this is uh, uh, the picture that was shot uh, last year when rain had led to this congestion. And, and, and this was also pretty frequent uh, 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 till the COVID crisis came in and, and then impacted the movement. But these kinds of images were common because these are massive highways, but they are not enough to cater to demand. Because remember when I said, if 15% of Delhi moves by car and we see this, what will happen when 100% of Delhi decides to move on car? I don't think we'll have enough space to accommodate everyone's aspiration of moving on to cars. So the question then becomes, what do we do? I think we need a paradigm change. We need a paradigm shift in approach, shift in design, and shift in thinking of how do we provide transportation to our people. So we have to move from moving cars to moving people which is the, also the underlying phenomena, the underlying message of the National Urban Transport Policy, which state that city should concentrate on moving people and not vehicle. And these are the images from Ahmedabad. Uh, you have a bus rapid transit corridor in the center. Uh, you have cycle tracks, you have footpath, you have parking spaces. And I know the BRT probably did not work out that well in Delhi, but again, we can look at uh, the other arrangements on how do you prioritize public transport. But that is very important. And it's not that these are conversations which are happening in isolation. In fact, uh, this is the, uh, uh, if you look at this slide, it talks about some of the sustainable transport trends. And if you concentrate uh, uh, on the graph, you will see post 2000, some of these trends have really picked up. Now, whether it is car sharing, whether it is bicycle sharing, whether it is car-free zones which have come in, whether it is bus rapid transit, whether it is metro, whether it is low emission zones, but these trends are picking up. And the reason why these trends are picking up is on one side, people and planners and administrators and, and, and policymakers are realizing that the business as usual will not take us to sustainability. And therefore, we have to change. Secondly, the technology is now available to us, which can help facilitate change. And therefore, as you see this trend uh, picking up, uh, I think we are not far behind when these trends will also catch up with, with our country. And no better place than to start these trends in Delhi. So the other interesting data, uh, which is also showing that why these trends are catching up, is that the new generation is not uh, uh, liking uh, the, the business as usual uh, as uh, they were doing it in the past. So people are now preferring to my fancy phone than actually looking at buying fancy cars. And if you look at the data which has come from the U, uh, from US as well as Britain, is that the new age generation is not buying the driving license. They are using uh, mass transit or they are also using shared mobility. <clears throat> and that's where the linkage of phone and on-demand services is also a, a great conduit on why people are, are, are not uh, uh, picking up driving license. And so if the newer generation is bringing a, around tr trend, this trend to change, the question then for us is how can we facilitate? Because the infrastructure choices that we make, the impact of those 
last for generations. So if you decide to build a flyover at one uh, some place else, at one place, the impact of that flyover will not be for four, five years, 10 years, but 50, 70 years would be its impact. And so if the generation of tomorrow is not going to drive, the question is why, why should we make the infrastructure choices uh, which we can help them uh, in, in this approach? So that is something which is interesting. It is happening and it will also happen in our country and our cities. So the question then becomes, how can we bring this paradigm shift to Delhi? And more importantly, what is your role to play in this paradigm shift? So let's look at first how things were happening. And anyone who has been to Luton's Delhi would realize, and so if these arrows represent uh, uh, the road network, you would realize that earlier the signals were not there. Uh, these were uncontrolled junctions. Then the roundabout came. And we realized that when the roundabout could not happen, handle the traffic, we started to put signals in these intersections. And you will see very clearly in many of these junctions in Luton's Delhi, is some of them might still have roundabout, but at a lot of places, these roundabout have been replaced by signal intersection. Now, when the traffic increased further, what did we do? We realized that the signals are not being able to handle the traffic, might as well convert this into a one-way road. And in fact, a lot of this one-way movement has also happened to the neighboring uh, cities of Gurgaon and Noida as well, that traffic engineers have taken these uh, uh, examples and replicated that we don't have enough space to accommodate traffic, signal is not holding uh, good, let's convert into one-way. And when the one-way doesn't work, what do we do? We either create a flyover or we create an underpass, thinking it will solve the traffic. But the question is, what if the flyover does not solve the traffic? What if there is more traffic? What do we do then? Because we have exhausted all our limits. And this is pretty common in many parts of the city where we have built flyovers, we are seeing jams on top of flyovers. So what do we do? And this is something which is interesting uh, for us to understand. So basically what we need is a new agenda for streets of Delhi. And the new agenda would revolve around three key principles. First is we have to design streets for all, which means we have to design streets for people to safely walk, for people to safely cycle, for people to safely use public transport. And that's where the speed becomes very, very important criteria. Because uh, let's assume that if a pedestrian is hit by a car at 30 kilometers per hour, the chances of survival is 90%. But if the same car is at 50 kilometers per hour, which is in fact legal maximum speed limit in most of the uh, streets in Delhi, the chances of survival are only 15%. And there is a conversation that let's increase the speed on our roads. Now that will actually become counterproductive because that would mean that we are actually putting at risk a lot of people who are walking and cycling in our cities. Therefore, in fact, uh, last this February, when India signed the, the Stockholm Declaration at the third interministerial conference, we became signatory to uh, this declaration, which aims at reducing road traffic deaths by 50% by 2030. One of the key recommendation of this declaration was any city road which has activities or cross movement should be designed and enforced for 30 kilometer or less. And this is where the 30 kilometer rule is very, very important for us. That because there are other road users who would be negatively impacted if we start increasing speed limit. So design for all, design for universal access, that's fundamental number one. Fundamental number two is how do we multiply that network capacity? Uh, because yes, the demand is increasing. How do we manage? And I think there are a few ways in which we can manage the rising demand. One, by looking at signal coordination. And this is something which has been tried in Delhi in the past uh, through the scoot system and then subsequently other forms of uh, systems were in, in place. But area-based traffic control, signal coordination is something that can further enhance 
the efficiency of the network. Second is to have a continuous lane width. Now, many roads we have seen will start from three lane, will become two lane, then maybe two and a half lane, and then three lane again. Now, that doesn't work because that creates bottleneck. So, we have to maintain continuous lane width so that the traffic flow is smooth. Third, which is very, very important, is how do we manage on street parking? Because parking can be looked at in multiple ways. On one side, parking can be used as an instrument to curtail demand. On the other side, parking can also incentivize more traffic. So managing parking on road is very important. And that is something that we need to look at. Then comes the other uh, uh, ways of multiplying the network. So in the long term, if we see, giving priority to buses is a great way of multiplying the throughput of road. Now, in the image, if you see two lanes of car in this picture is carrying about 4,000 persons per hour. One lane of buses can carry almost 15,000 persons per hour. And I know uh, Delhi did try to experiment with the bus rapid transit. It did not get the required uh, uh, result, but that does not mean the concept is flawed. I think we have to contextualize this concept in, into our setting and rework at the whole model on how do we get, give priority to buses. Because huge amount of people in Delhi uh, are still moving on buses. So that's uh, uh, another way to look at on how do we multiply the network capacity. Third, very, very important on how do you manage the crossing. Now we have seen in the past that crossings can be used to one facilitate uh, pedestrian crossing. But if these crossings are not managed well, uh, it can act as counterproductive to pedestrian movement. A lot of times that we think that maybe putting a flyover and an underpass will solve the problem. No, it doesn't solve the problem because no one likes to cross a two-storied up, walk, and then come down two-storied below to cross a road. People like to cross at grade. So how do we manage the crossing is something which is very, very important for us. And we have seen many great examples of Delhi of designing intersection but I think we need a lot more. And this is where I think looking at a scientific uh, way of redesigning intersection, and this is a very interesting work done by my colleagues in Mumbai called HP Junction, on looking at reimagining uh, 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 the intersection so that it can facilitate uh, a great movement of pedestrian. So these are the few important things I thought I'll share with you today. And, and we'll be doing more such courses, talking about more in detail in the coming module. And, and, and these, are, these are my coordinates. I'll be happy to answer your questions, reply to you in case you have any further demand. So with this, uh, thanks a lot for joining uh, this presentation and, and, and thank you again.